Hello, good afternoon, everybody. So welcome to the our third live stream today. Uh, we will be covering locus, parabola and quadratic polynomials. So these are topics that is purely two unit uh, advanced mathematics topics. Next week, we'll cover the extension one uh, part of this topic as well called parametrics. So let's get right into it. So if you haven't seen uh, our live classrooms from the last two weeks, this is a bit of a summary around what to expect. Uh, today, I, I pretty anticipate the live lesson won't go over the hour because this is a relatively simple topic, I would say. So I'm, and I'm anticipating to wrap it up in the hour. So we do have a Q&A and join our Facebook group. Uh, you can definitely ask questions there. So I'll just quickly show you guys how to do that. So if you go into Facebook and type Pinnacle Live Discussion Group, so you can join this group, post your questions as a photo or as a written question, and we will definitely respond to you. And this just also helps us uh, sort of keep the conversation uh, within the group. There is actually a chat box next to this live stream as well, if you're watching this from YouTube. So during uh, this one hour lesson, if you feel like you don't understand a certain thing or you would like me to backtrack a little bit, just uh, type in any comments in the chat box and I'll definitely uh, be watching that. And this is only our third live stream. We are still testing out how to deliver the content in the best way possible. So I, we just ask for your patience uh, and any feedback is absolutely welcome. Let's get started. So a little bit about me. My name is Amy. I'm the co-founder of Pinnacle Coaching and I'm also the head teacher for mathematics within Pinnacle. So I've been teaching maths for a very long time. I personally specialize in extension two and extension one maths. So that's what I teach at my center. Uh, and I've definitely had a lot of students who's achieved great results in the past. So going straight into the first topic, locus. So locus is one of those topics that uh, a lot of students tend to sort of fear that word or is that, what is locus or is this mysterious word uh, and not sure what to do with the questions under the area. But if you take a step back, it really just um, is coordinate geometry and I'm hoping to sort of dispel some of those fear around locus and how to tackle those questions today. So what exactly is locus? So a locus, is a set of points whose location satisfy or is determined, determined by one or more specified conditions. So, I mean, it sounds fancy, but as you'll see in some of the questions later, conditions could be a distance condition. So for example, P has to be moving at a certain distance from two points or something like that, or it could be a gradient condition. Um, so at the end of the day, I'm going to jump ahead a bit to the next slide. Now, just also so that you know this, you don't have to manually write this down. Uh, this is all um, downloadable from our website. And I'll just actually quickly show you guys how to do that. So you're not like trying to write down all these notes and stuff like that. So if you go to our website, www pinnaclecoaching.com.au and just go into resources, Pinnacle Life, online lessons. And then you can see uh, there are the pre previous two lessons. If that's going to help you, definitely worth a watch. So if you go into lesson three, which is today's lesson, so you can re-watch today's live stream uh, after uh, we've finished today. And you can download a booklet from here 
which has all the material that's on the slide deck. And that's an additional practice set for you to practice some of the stuff you've learned today as well. And it's got fully worked answers. So feel free to use that as a study tool. All right, so sorry, sidetracked a bit. So as I mentioned, let me just skip to the next slide. Uh, examples of locus and pictures are a little bit fuzzy, but the idea here is we're just working with graphs, yeah? So it's all going to come out as a function of some sort, like a straight line, circle, parabola, they are the most common one. That's what we're trying to deduce in a lot of these questions. So coming back here, typically there are two steps to any locus question. So the first step is to identify the condition that defines how the point moves. So as I mentioned, it can be a, a distance condition, it can be a gradient condition, and so on and so forth. So depending on, um, so let me just give you an example. For example, PA is equals to PB. That's uh, an example of a distance condition. Uh, depending on what is the condition, you'll use a different set of formulas to help you. So you should be choosing from the standard coordinate uh, geometry formulas. So that's the second step. If it's a distance condition, use the distance formula. If it's a gradient condition, use the gradient formula. If it's uh, got to do with a perpendicular distance, so usually it's not going to tell you it's going to be perpendicular distance, but when you have a straight line and you're working with a point and you're working with uh, the distance of this point to the straight line, quite often perpendicular distance could be the helpful formula here. So let's have a look at some of the typical exam questions in this area. Right, so in this question, we've got two points, minus one, zero, two, zero, and P is a, the variable point. And we suppose that P moves so that the distance from A is twice the distance from B, find the locus. All right, so to help you visualize this, let's draw this. So we've got a point B at two, zero, and A, minus one, zero. So imagine P is a moving point so that the distance to A is twice the distance to B. So let's say that's a one of the points. All right, so this is double the distance here, okay? All right, so we are trying to figure out, well, what is the equation? or the locus that basically fits that description, right? PA is twice PB, and we want to find out how that moves. So let's have a look. So the first step in any locus question is to identify the condition, which is expressly written in the question. So PA is twice PB, yeah? Distance from A is twice the distance from B. Once you've found a condition, then, because it's a distance condition, let's apply the distance formula. So distance formula on those two points. All right, so that's the first one. Let me just simplify that a tad. and then repeat the same for the other one. So these two points. Okay, so once I've got that, Usually, because distance have a square root in it, how you're going to sub it into the condition is this. Instead of using PA is equal to 2PB, just square both sides. Don't forget to square the 2 as well. So we want to use PA square is equal to 4PB square. And then now we sub these two in there.
All right, so the square gets rid of the square root and we're gonna fully expand everything as well. So you can see it's not incredibly difficult. You just have to be very careful with your algebra and your expansion. And I think that's the part that tricks a lot of people. All right, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to move everything from the left side to the right side. Hold on, that's missing a four. Let me put that in. Okay, so zero is equal to four x squared minus x squared. So I'm just subtracting that one. Uh, we've got the next one, 16x minus 2x. What have we got next? 4y squared minus y squared. And then I've got six 16 and 1 so it's plus 16 minus 1. Okay, so that keeps it clean I just paired it up. All right so you might notice that everything is divisible by 3. I'm just going to continue up here. Uh, so I'm just going to divide everything by 3. Okay, so now we are going to complete the square to try to create the equation. So I'm moving the plus 5 to the other side, so it becomes minus 5. So um, complete the square, you add the middle term, so middle term is minus 6, so add the middle term square. So half of 6 is 3, add 3 square, add it to both sides so your equations are balanced and that's your perfect square. Now you, you'll find that we do a lot of complete the square, so let's see 9 minus 5 is 4. Okay, so that's the answer. Yeah, you'll find that we'll be doing a lot of complete the square in this area. All right, so we found the equation. So we're going to describe this geometrically. Now, if you have any question, I would like to remind you there is a chat box on the side if you're watching the stream from um, YouTube. So just feel free to utilize that. Okay, so moving to the next part, describe this geometrically. So let's copy the question first. I mean, not the question, but the answer from the previous part. So we found that the locus was x minus 3 square plus y square is equals to 4. All right, so therefore, the locus of P, actually, you know what, instead of writing this, let's type this because it's a bit hard to write. All right, so do this. So the locus of P is a circle with center three zero and radius four. Right, so I think that way you can see that more clearly as well. All right, so that's it. Nice and easy one. So moving on to the next one, I just want to also explore a condition that uses a slightly different formula. This is a gradient condition. So what we've got here is let's um, sketch the situation here we've got. Two points, two one, and minus four three. Okay. 
and we've got the point APB is 90 degrees. So let's say P is here. So this is 90 degrees. Okay, so in other words, the condition here is that the gradient of AP times the gradient of BP should equal to minus one, which is the condition for perpendicular lines. So that's how you're going to use that information. All right, so given that's the condition, we're going to try to get the gradient of those two sections first. So let's start with the gradient of AP. All right, so that's it. So I'm just using the gradient formula, just backtracking a bit. The gradient formula is y2 minus y1 on x2 minus x1. Okay, and then the other one. is so y minus 3 and then x minus minus 4 which is x plus 4. Okay so once you've got that now we substitute this into the condition. So that looks complicated, but what I'm going to do is just regroup it a bit. So top times the top and then the bottom times the bottom. And I'm actually going to multiply that across. So I don't have a fraction anymore. Okay, so I've taken the denominator across. Expand. And then just collect any like terms, try to simplify it a bit. Same with this one. I'm just going to collect the like terms. And then expand the negative out. So the left side is the same. All right, what I'm going to do is move all the x's and y's to that side and move the constant to the left side. So x squared plus 2x, y squared minus 4y is equal to um, 8 minus 3, which is 5. Then I'm going to complete the square. So I add 1 squared, so half of 2 squared, and... 2 squared to this one, so half of 4 squared, and you make sure you do that to the other side as well to balance the equation. All right, so now you've got the perfect squares. And on the right side, you've got uh, 5 plus 4 plus another one, so that's 10. Okay. So that's more or less it in terms of finding the equation of the locus. So that's the answer. Let me box that for you. And we want to describe this. So this is a circle. So therefore, the locus of P is a circle with center minus one, two, radius root 10. Let's write that one in. Okay. So, so that's more or less it, and that pretty much describes the locus. So just to summarize, the key step here is 
first you have to identify what the condition is yeah so this is a condition uh relating to a right angle which is using the fact that it's perpendicular so that's a gradient condition so you use the gradient formula to build the two separate gradients uh, substitute them into your condition multiply it expand collect so i think that's where it gets a bit confusing just do it slowly and make sure you're collecting the like terms and expand everything properly uh, once you've done that once you get close to this stage you have to complete this square so complete the square half of that middle term square half of that middle term square whatever you add to one side add it to the other side so your equation balances and then once you get the equation that's more or less it and then you conclude all right so those two are i think the most common type of locus questions you'll get now in that practice set in uh, on our website i think there is a third type which uses the perpendicular distance formula so if you want to explore uh what what, what that looks like just feel free and go check it out yourself all right so that's it for locuses not too hard moving on to parabola now this is one of those things because it's not really on the reference sheet you do have to remember it and quite often it's taught as eight different formulas but what i like to do is sort of try to group them so it's easier to remember first of all and stick to remember remembering what the basic forms look like so in the this is basically the basic form so i'm gonna sort of cut that into two halves so the left half you're dealing with concave up concave down positive is concave up negative is concave down now this here uh, a for a a is your focal length so focal length is literally the distance from the vertex to the focus and the vertex to the directrix so that's why those are the coordinates of the focus and directrix and you may have noticed that um i forgot what i wanted to say anyway so that's the first one and then the second one oh yes i remember what i wanted to say so you may notice that the focus is inside the bowl and the directrix is outside the bowl so that's something you observe as well y square 4ax and y squared minus 4ax is like a right left situation so this is a right left okay uh apart from that the interpretation is very similar a is focal length so from focus uh sorry from vertex to focus and vertex to directrix vertex to focus vertex to directrix okay so i've mentioned it's um there are actually eight formulas but the next four is just the translated forms okay, okay. so the translated forms is literally using your understanding of transformation so if you replace x with x minus h and then y with y minus k what that does is you're shifting it to the right by h up by k assuming they're both positive numbers so it means that your new vertex here is h k so i'll use this as an example to show you and that's why i find don't remember eight forms just remember the basic forms what they look like and know how to shift them and move them so if I move this according to this formula here, so imagine this ball here, so this ball here to the right by H, so do, 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 and then up by K. So it will have a vertex H, K. So it will be up here like that, okay? so everything else moves in it so the focus which was originally here also has to move right move up so use your judgment what the new coordinates would be so it will be h uh, k plus a okay and then same with the directrix it should be a units so y is equal to k minus a 
yeah, below the new vertex. So that's more or less it. So just know how to do that and it should be pretty easy. So the standard form for the next one is the same. You replace X with X minus H, Y with Y minus K. And that's exactly the same even for these two forms. So Y minus K square equals to 4A X minus H. Now that also means that you have a vertex at hk okay so it will literally be so let me just try to move this for you so move this to the right by h up by k so let's say here so it's now there and obviously the directrix and the focus trying to the focus okay so let's say here okay directrix focus yeah was also move with it. And same with this one, y minus k square equals to minus 4a x minus h. All right, so once you've got that, we can now have a look at some examples and see how we can apply this. So the first one, exercise three, we are given this parabola. We want to find the features. So firstly, we need to marry it up with one of the standard forms. So to be able to do that, if it's a fully expanded version like this, what you need to do is complete the square so that you can compare it to one of the forms. So what I'm gonna do is move that 25 across and complete the square so remember add the middle term square half the middle term square so one square one square to both sides so that's 8y minus 24 now and that's your perfect square okay factorize the 8 out and i'm just gonna reshuffle this a bit like that Okay, so once you've got that, let's go back to here. So you pick out the correct form, yeah, that matches up with what you have. Basically, you're looking for either x square or y square. So in our case, it's an x square. So you want to compare it to x minus h square equals to 4a y minus k. Okay, so from here, we can now tell uh, what's what. So you can see that H is minus one and K is three. So that means the vertex is minus one, three. Okay, now focal length wise, four A is equal to eight, meaning focal length is eight on four, which is two. Okay, all right, so once we've got all of that, we can now answer the question. So A, find the coordinate of the vertex, which we've got, B, okay, so B, the focus. Now, I would strongly recommend you try to draw this so that you don't get this wrong. So minus one, three. Okay, so let's say it's here, it's the vertex. And focal length of two means focus is two units above it. So minus one, add two, so five. Okay, so this should be two units. That's what focal length is. So your focus is um, minus one, five. And then C, sketch. Okay, I kind of done the sketch already, but I'll sketch it properly on this side and I'll also draw in the directrix as well. Okay, so that's let's say minus one three, not very much to scale, but you get the point minus one five is the focus and then the directrix should be two units below that because the focal length is two. So y is equal to one is where the focus is going, I mean, the focus directrix is going to be. 
All right, so that's more or less it. So to summarize, first step, if you have an equation that is not factorized or in the standard form, you need to complete the square and factorize it first. So you complete the square on the quadratic, yeah? So that's what you do. Uh, then you pick out a standard form to compare it to. So this time I've compared it to x minus h squared equals to 4ay minus k. Uh, you can simply read off your vertex from the numbers and focal length. Once you've worked all that out, it's just a matter of mapping out well, which basic form it was. So this is the concave up type, and then just everything falls into place as a result. So moving on to the next one. What we've got here is uh, kind of the opposite. We're given a couple of features about this and we have to try to deduce uh, the equation of the parabola. I think it helps to draw this so you can visualize. I know personally, I am a very visual person and I so solve a lot of the, especially the four unit problems, I like to draw stuff, yeah? So you might want to do that as well if you're a visual person like me, okay? All right, so we've got focus is zero, four, directrix is minus four. First thing, vertex is always halfway between the focus and directrix, so it's just sort of like dotting that out. Halfway between the point and the line is here, and you can already guess where that point has to be. So uh, halfway between minus four and zero is minus two, and it should be the same height as the focus, so minus two, four and it has to curve towards the focus, okay? So going back to our standard form, right? Let's come back to the standard form. So this sort of right curving type of parabola has this type of standard form. So I'm gonna copy that across. Okay, and then we're gonna sub in the different elements. So firstly, h is minus two. So this bit is minus two. Okay, and k is four. All right, so we filled out those bits. Now you see, that, you see we're still missing a, but you can work that out. That's literally the focal length, the distance from vertex to focus. So it's two, All right? So four times two. That's it. All right, nice and easy. As long as you know which one is your standard form, it shouldn't be too hard for you to work it out. All right, moving on. So this is another example where a bit of factorization is required. So let's have a look. So first, I'm going to move the 2x to the other side. And complete the square. Remember, you complete the square on the quadratic, which is the y uh, equation at the moment. So add half of 4, so add 2 square to both sides. That's your perfect square. Take out the two. That's it. Okay. Now, again, go pick out the standard form to compare. So let's go back. So you have this y square format. So it's one of the standard forms. So let's copy that across so we can compare it directly. Let me just write that in. Okay. So we are comparing y minus k square equals to 4a x minus h. So you can see here, k is 2, 4a is 2, h is minus 2. So a is a half as a result. Okay, so that tells you everything. All right, a. We want to sketch the parabola and show the vertex on, on your sketch. So based on 
our coordinates vertex should be at minus two too so let's draw something that resembles that so minus two two here All right, so that's good enough. All right, then find the coordinate of the focus in the equation of the directrix. So uh, remember, that's what the focal length is for. The focus should be half a unit above the vertex, so minus 2, add a half to 2, so 2 and a half. And the directrix should be half a unit below so two minus a half is one and a half that's it so to answer that question focus is minus two two and a half directrix is y is equal to one and a half all right so nice and easy as long as you know what you're looking for so just to summarize the steps here We've got the equation, which we need to complete the square first so that we know the standard form. So add two square to both sides. Now you've got a perfect square. Then you can compare that to the standard form and read off all the values. Oh, hold on a sec. Silly me. So let me just redo this. <coughs> All right, don't ever do that in the exam. I forgot to. So see if you picked up my mistake. I forgot to actually account for the shape. So let's redo this. Okay. All right, so vertex. So this shape, y squared 4ax, has a rightward facing parabola shape that's what i was meaning to draw so let's do that all right so that's a bit better okay so then uh focus should be two sorry a half a unit all right half a unit from this Make sure I got that right. Yep, half a unit. So focus uh, minus two plus a half, so minus one and a half, two. And the directrix should be at x is equals to <clears throat> minus two minus another half, so minus two and a half. All right, so that the correction here, minus one and a half, two. And the directrix is minus two and a half. All right. So make sure you account for the shape as well. And that's it. So I would say for parabolas, it's not too hard as long as you always refer back to the four standard forms. Are you working with concave up, concave down, or are you working with concave to the right, concave to the left? work out what the standard form is, work out the focal length and vertex, and you're pretty much done from there. All right, so finally, we are going to cover um, some of the stuff relating to quadratic polynomials. So I'll say the focus is probably more around like roots uh, and the use of the discriminant theorem, because I think that's the type of theory that students tend to struggle with in the exam. Obviously, this topic is a lot broader than that uh, it talks about a lot about graphing quadratic formula itself so those things pretty standard i'm pretty sure the textbook covers it pretty well as well all right so i mean for those who don't remember i'll do a quick summary so if any quadratic equation should be in the form of ax squared plus bx plus c a b c are known as the coefficients of the respective term if you want to solve this to zero you can use the quadratic formula to help you now that little thing under the square root is called a discriminant why is that is because it decides 
the number of solutions you are going to have. Now, if you think about this, it makes perfect sense because if it's zero, for example, if the discriminant is zero, you're going to end up square rooting zero. So you're going to have just minus b on 2a, right? If your discriminant is less than or equal to zero, you can't even square root. You can't square root a negative number. So usually you have no solutions in those instances. All right, so hence the comment, unreal or imaginary solutions. And your discriminant is greater than uh, zero. Uh, you're going to have more than one solution greater than or equal to, then you have real zeros, okay? So that's pretty much the basic tie between the discriminant itself and the quadratic formula. As long as you understand how the square root operates within the quadratic formula, the discriminant theory is going to make a lot of sense. So also very quickly, just summarizing uh, some terminology here. What is a definite? What is an indefinite? So I'll start with definite first. So it's break this up into two parts. Okay, so there's two types, right? Positive and negative, definite. So how I think about this is positive definite simply means definitely positive. So the parabola is entirely above the x-axis, so definitely positive. So that's associated with a leading coefficient that's positive but a discriminant that is negative because that way you will not have any x-intercept. Negative definite, on the other hand, is definitely negative. So the only difference is discriminant is still less than zero because you're not going to have any solutions, but the leading is negative. Indefinite is pretty much everything else. So you've got broadly four types. So you've got type that just touches the axis, so that's the concept of the equal root or double root or you have a parabola that's kind of crossing the axis. so you've got more than one answer one two okay so both of these are positive indefinite okay so positive still means the leading is positive so that one is discriminant is equal to zero that one is greater than zero uh, whereas on the negative side, this uh, sorry, leading coefficient is negative. This time it's the same thing but concave down. So this is single equal root. This is double. I mean not double but two roots. All right, so discriminant is positive. Discriminant is equal to zero. All right, so that's how I remember the terminology because quite often, I mean, right now it's still fresh in your mind, so you know it's pretty easy. Uh, I do see quite often once we get up to HSC or around trials, a lot of students forget these very basic definitions. Uh, so it's a good idea just use the fact that definite is all positive. Uh, definite means always positive or definitely positive. Negative definite is definitely negative. Okay, I think those are sort of a good trigger to remember this and everything else whenever you have a solution is indefinite. And then finally, just tying the roots to coefficients. So if you have roots uh, alpha and beta of a quadratic, it can be written as two factors, x minus alpha, x minus beta. If you expand it, it will look something like that. And that pretty much gives you the result how roots are linked to um, the coefficient. Because if you think about the standard quadratic ax bx plus c equals a zero, and you divide the a across on every time. So you can see that b on a is supposed to be minus alpha plus beta, so hence the sum of the root equation. And c on a is meant to be alpha beta, so hence the product of the roots equation. All right, so we'll play around with these formulas as well. Let's take a look at the next exercise.
All right, so this is a roots question. Uh, we want to find the value of P given certain relationships in the root. So starting with the first one, right? If the roots are opposite in sign, I'm going to let the roots be uh, alpha and minus alpha, so opposite in sign. So in other words, when you look at sum of the roots, so alpha minus alpha is equal to minus B on A. Alpha minus alpha is equal to, now B in this expression is minus P. A is one. So that's zero is equal to P. And that's it, okay, P is equal to zero. All right, part B, if they are real, real means one or two roots. Or in other words, you want the discriminant to be greater than or equal to zero. So let's start by calculating the discriminant. So B, C, A, okay? So B squared minus 4AC minus P, square so minus p minus 4 a c a is 1 c is p okay so now we want to solve that to greater than or equal to zero now don't rookie mistake this factorize is a quadratic you need to look at the graph or you can test this on the number line. I prefer graph because it's fast. So you draw the parabola that represents that. So you can see passes through zero and four. And you want this parabola to be greater than or equal to zero. So let me highlight this. So greater than or equal to zero is sort of this section here and this section here. Okay, so this bit and this bit. All right, so in other words, you want it to be less than or equal to zero or greater than or equal to four. So therefore, P is less than or equal to zero or greater than or equal to four. Now, this is a bit of a trick question. If you go back and read the question, yes, yeah? so I always do this in the exam C. We read the question after you answer that and see if you addressed it or missed anything. Because this is a tricky part. P is supposed to be greater than zero, so you need to ditch that answer. Okay. Okay, and that goes um, for the previous one because P is supposed to be greater than zero, equal to zero is not a valid solution. All right, so that is it. So uh, just summarizing what's been covered. So you use uh, the relationship in the roots in the first case, the roots are opposite in sign, let them be alpha and minus alpha. I only explore some of the roots that gets you the P value, but it's outside the specify uh, P value in the question. So hence there's no solutions. The second one real just means you want the discriminant to be greater than or equal to zero. In effect, you're solving a quadratic to greater than or equal to zero. So quickly draw the quadratic, decipher which part of the graph is above zero, so above zero, and then um, conclude the values. Again, because of the restriction in the question, it's only greater than or equal to four only. All right, so let's take a look at a slightly different one. Next one. Uh, find the values of Q if that is a negative definite. Okay, so remember what negative definite means. Negative definite means it's down here, right? It's entirely under the axis. So there are two features associated with that. So firstly, you need the discriminant to be less than zero. So it has no solutions. We are going to start with that condition first. So B squared minus 4. A, 
C. All right, so that's our starting point. Simplifying this. Hold on, I think that's not typed correctly. Hold on a sec, I'm just gonna amend this a little bit. Okay, I think it's meant to be 3qx squared minus 5x plus 3q equals to zero. That makes more sense. All right, so that's meant to be 3q, so q squared. Okay, that's better. All right, so let's solve that to less than zero. Now, quadratic inequality means you should try to use a graph to assist. I'm going to factorize it first. Now, in other words, just on the side here, if you solve this to zero, you've got five minus six Q is zero, five plus six Q is zero, so Q is equal to uh, five on six, and this one Q is equal to minus five on six. All right, so that just tells you, if I was to quickly whip up this graph, uh, where are the intersections? So minus five on six, and five on six and don't forget to account for, for concavity so the negative number in front of the q square it means it's concave down all right so you want it to be less than zero so less than zero is okay let me just use yellow so this part and this part so you, therefore q has to be either less than minus five on six or uh greater than five on six all right but we want negative definite negative definite means your leading coefficient should be negative which can only happen when q is negative so since it is negative definite Therefore, Q is less than minus 5 on 6. And that is it. All right, so to summarize, first we identify what is the meaning of uh, negative definite. May, mainly to pass to this, um, discriminant has to be less than 0. And, <clears throat> and the fact that the leading coefficient, which is 3Q here, should be negative. So first we've got the discriminant, solved it to less than zero. Uh, we solved it to zero to find the actual intercepts so we can draw a rough sketch of the parabola. We've identified that it's less than zero here and here. So it's negative uh, either less than minus five on six or greater than five on six. Uh, but then we want it to be negative, so it's only the left answer. All right. So the next one, I'm going to play a bit around with the roots. So the first one, to get alpha squared plus beta squared, you need to consider the expansion of a perfect square, and that's how you get to it. So you can see alpha squared plus beta squared is just part of the expansion. So if I move that to the other side, you can get alpha squared plus beta squared by finding what the sum of the roots and product of the roots is. So start with sum of the roots, so minus b on a squared, and then product of roots, c on a, so c is minus 9, a is 3. All right, so just simplifying these numbers, so that's 16, and then that's plus uh, 6. So therefore, alpha squared plus beta squared is equal to 16 plus 
six, which is 22. That's it. All right, so the second part. We are going to add these two things together. So the first step is to make it one fraction. I think I got there too quickly. Hold on. I'll give you an extra step. So you need to obviously create a common denominator, so times beta on beta to that first one and alpha on alpha to the first one. Sorry, I jumped the, jumped there too quickly. And then now we add since they've got a common denominator. All right, so this we have the answer to 22, yeah, from the previous part. And the bottom, we actually kind of have the answer to it. So it's actually that number there. I'll note it down. So alpha beta is C on A minus 3. So minus 3. And that is it. Not very tricky at all as long as you know what you're looking for. All right. So the first one uh, to summarize, you will need to use or consider the perfect square to get you there. And then once you've done that, the second one is just about making it one fraction. All right, so moving on to the last one. Last one is a slightly more tricky exam question that's got a lot of parts to it and it's utilizing a lot of different concepts and being able to connect discriminant theorem and what it means for the number of solution um, that really sort of teases out what is sort of the use of a discriminant theorem. All right, we'll start with the first one nice and easy. Find the coordinates of the focus of that. Okay, so firstly, y is equal to x squared plus 4 is not something you want to work with because it's not in the standard form. So what you want to do is move the 4 to the other side first. Now again, what you would like to do is compare that to the standard form. So now we can see very clearly that H is zero, K is four, yeah? Four A is one, because you don't see any number in front of that. So if you put a bracket around that, it will just be one. So A is a quarter, all right? So with that in mind, this is a concave up type of parabola. So just, so just drawing this. I mean, you should know what this looks like, x squared plus 4. Yeah, so x squared plus 4. So the focal length is a quarter. So it should be at 0, 4 and a quarter. And that's it. All right, so that's the answer to the first one. I'll note it down up here as well. All right, so the second one, the graphs of y equals to x squared plus 4 and y equals to x plus k only has one point of intersection p. Show that it satisfies this equation. So the second part, what you want to do is solve these two simultaneously. Because you're talking about intersection between two graphs, that's pretty much the only way to create anything that links them together. So we're gonna sub one into two. So sub that into that. And moving everything to the left side. And that's it, okay? So now, just want you to be aware of this. What this tells us is the X coordinates of the intersection between the line and the parabola. So depending on how many solutions you have, so I know we're gonna have a tangent, so something like that, okay? So if, there, if that is a tangent, that should only have one solution. So keep that in mind. So if y equals to x plus k, 
uh, have only one point of intersection. That means only one solution. Yeah, so I hope that makes sense. And that pretty much drives how we answer part C. You use the discriminant and all otherwise to find the value of K. Right, so the equation from the previous part was x squared minus x plus 4 minus k is equal to 0. Okay, all right, so I just want to highlight the fact that this is in the format ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to 0. So that entire part is your c. We are going to calculate the discriminant, which is b squared minus 4ac. So b is minus 1. 4, a is 1, c is the entire thing. And then expand. So 4k minus 15 is your discriminant. So what, what am I going to do with the discriminant? So as I mentioned in the previous part, you can only have one point of intersection if you only have one solution. So you want one solution, just going back to the theory here. One solution is this situation here. You have a set of equal roots, equal, but um, one answer essentially. All right, so for the quadratic, to produce one solution, the discriminant should equal to zero. So 4k minus 15 should equal to zero. So k is 15 on 4. And that's it. All right, that was a very, very easy solve. And then finally, find the coordinates of p. So just going back to the question, so P is that point there, roughly, okay? So what we could do is put the K value, which we've just calculated, put it back into the equation and actually find the coordinate. It should tell us the coordinate because it's literally the intersection between those two things. All right, so that's exactly what we're going to do. The sub. K is 15 on 4 into this. Oops, I just subbed it right in. I'm ahead of myself today. All right, K. All right, so let's sub it in. simplify those numbers now if you've done this correctly it should be a perfect square um, once you uh, sub it in because that's kind of the condition for a single equal root not a single but like equal double roots all right so x is equal to a half that's your answer and what we've got here is the x coordinate. So how do we find the y coordinate? You sub it back into y is equal to x squared plus 4 and work it out. So 4 and a quarter. All right, so therefore p is a half and 4 and a quarter. And that's it. Final part. Show that SP is parallel to the directrix of the parabola. So let's have a look at what we've got. So what we've calculated, so this is y is equal to x squared plus 4. The focus I've calculated from before is 0 and 4 and a quarter. 
and we just worked out P from the previous part is a half and four and a quarter. Okay, so in fact, if I was to draw in the tangent, we did find that K value was 15 and four, wasn't it? Okay, so that's the equation. Y is equal to, uh, what was the equation? X plus K, so X plus 15 and four. Okay, all right, so visually looking at this it's pretty obvious that if you look at that interval sp they have the same y coordinate meaning it's horizontal and what do we know about the um what do we know about the directrix the directrix is also horizontal okay so in fact if i was to draw in the directrix i think it will be here actually Okay. All right. So, so this thing is not very much to scale. So the directrix should be a quarter below four, so three and three quarters, which is basically fifteen on four. All right. So how do we conclude this? So since S and P have the same y coordinates. Therefore, SP is a horizontal line. Which is parallel to the directrix. Um, that is also horizontal if you want to explain yourself, but that's basically it. All right, so that is it. Let's summarize. So there's a lot of parts to this question. This is actually based off on HSC questions, just to show you how this area is getting examined. All right, so the first part is very simple stuff, finding the focus. So you just need to compare it, rearrange it, compare it to the standard form, work out the vertex, work out the focal length, and then that's pretty much it. The second part draws on the discriminant theorem. So we want to look at the intersection between a line and a parabola. Now, just also so that you know, as a part of our discussions, if, okay, I'll do it down here. There's three ways a straight line can interact with a parabola. One is if it cuts, cuts it twice. So you're gonna have two solutions. It should be greater than zero. Second case, just touching, so a tangent, one solution, that's the case we're looking at. And if it doesn't touch it at all, no solutions, less than zero. Okay, so that's what we're looking at here. So you solve it simultaneously first, so you can have an equation that studies uh, the intersection between those two things. Once you've done that, then we look at the discriminant in this case, solve it to zero. Uh, so we solve it to zero because we are looking at this case where there's only one point of intersection. All right, so we found that K is 15 on four. Then the next part is finding the coordinate of P. So let's just sub that back in, solve it. It should come out a perfect square if you've done this correctly. So it's a half. Work out the Y coordinate by resubstituting back into the quadratic. So the point is a half four and a quarter. And then finally, why is this parallel to the directrix? Well, you can see that very clearly. They are literally horizontal from one another. So it's a horizontal line. Directrix itself is also a horizontal line. So therefore they are parallel. That's essentially the conclusion. All right, so I hope that's helped you. Um, a lot of these examples, I've chosen them because that's usually the concepts that gets examined in most assessments. So make sure you get your head around it. Uh, and I would like to remind you guys, there is extra practice on our website as mentioned earlier. So feel free to check it out. So thank you for your time today. Um, so if you would like to join the Q&A session, feel free to type in any questions you have in the chat box or go to our Facebook 
group, so Pinnacle Live discussion group, uh, to discuss any qu further questions you have. You can post pictures of questions and or any topic suggestions for um, future live streams. And all the material can be downloaded off our website at pinnaclecoaching.com.au slash pinnaclelive. Thank you for your time today. I'll see you all next week.